Thanks to all of you. Absolutely, it is such a pleasure. We are here uh, today to celebrate families. Uh, por los habladores de español, eh, estamos aquí para celebrar a las familias en la unificación de las familias que pasan. Speaking to families in Spanish is easy. Listening to families, to youth, to children who've been a part of the system and doing something with what we hear is the difficult part. But David and I both are committed to hearing those voices. Because those voices, your voices, for us are the measures of our success or of our failure. Yes, we have probably 450,000 or more kids in our foster care system today. That's as of 2017, the numbers have inched up. The federal government's usually a bit behind on, on collecting data. Many of those kids, many of those families have very little option except to be a part of that system. But many more of those families, many more of those children, many more of those youth that you've already heard are in the system not because they were physically abused, not because they were sexually abused, but because of what we call neglect, which is more times than not linked in some critical way to poverty, to the inability of families who love their children to provide for and meet their basic needs. And in a child welfare system, you know what welfare means? The term welfare, the root of that means well-being. In a child well-being system, historically we have allowed families to sink to such a level of difficulty, of despair, oftentimes desperation, before we offer the most basic, fundamental, critical services that they need in order to care for their children, in order to keep them under their own roof, in order to keep them in their schools, their communities, with the families, the friends that they know. And we wait as a child welfare system until a call comes into the hotline that says something bad has happened to a child before we put those services and that response into place. And I think that's just wrong. I think it is absolutely wrong not to offer families the critical supports that not just families need who come into the child welfare system, but what any family out there needs or could potentially need. And we know what those things are, don't we? We know that any family out there needs to be able to provide for the basic concrete supports of their families. Housing, electricity, food, clothing, the basics. Yet so many of our families in our child welfare system have not been able to meet those basic concrete needs. We know that any family out there needs social connections. We need to feel a part of a bigger community. We need to have friends and family and others that we can turn to when life is difficult for us. Instead, so many of our families have become isolated and don't have those critical supports. We know that any family out there, any parent out there, needs to know something about how to rear children, needs to know the basics of how to parent in healthy and safe ways. Yet because so many of the difficulties of our families cross generations, many parents never had that opportunity themselves to learn those critical skills. And they and their children suffer as a result of that. We know that any family out there 
needs a measure of resiliency in their lives because guess what? Under the best of circumstances, we're all gonna face some hard times somewhere and it's our ability to get through those hard times that can make a difference between coming into the child welfare system and being able to stay together safely, to remain unified as a family. And we also know that any family out there needs to be able to instill within their children the social, the emotional competence that will help them develop the skills and their own resiliency to deal with a world that is very often quite inhospitable to the families that experience our child welfare system. We have a vision in the Children's Bureau, and for those of you who don't know, the Children's Bureau is the oldest federal government agency out there that is devoted to uh, the needs of children and families. It was established well over 100 years ago when we administer funding for foster care programs, for child protection programs, for adoption, and some other programs. But most of the funding that we administer, 95% or more, is to pay somebody else to take care of children. And only a fraction of that budget goes to investing in the capacity of parents to care for their children themselves. And our vision in the Children's Bureau is to flip that system upside down. You won't hear David and me or others talking a whole lot about improving our child welfare system. Because I don't think our child welfare system was set up to deal with the many issues that we deal with today. You will hear us talking about changing the child welfare system. Changing it from a reactionary, after the fact, wait until the call comes in to the hotline kind of a system to one that joins with communities, joins with community-based agencies, public, private, government, non-government, faith-based, secular, to create the kinds of conditions in the communities where children and families live that will give them the opportunity to thrive. Thrive! Not just stay out of the door of the child welfare agency. Every child, every family out there deserves the opportunity to thrive. I was out in Colorado not too long ago meeting with a group of parents like we do all the time because we want to hear their voices. I want to know what those experiences are so that we can do better by them. And I asked this group of four or five parents out there, what does it mean to you to thrive? It's heartbreaking, some of the answers that we got. First woman raised her hand and said, I would be thriving if I could live in an apartment that didn't have mold in it. Or if I was living in an apartment that was wheelchair accessible so that if it caught on fire, my wheelchair-bound husband would not perish in the fire. That would mean thriving to me. And most of us, many of us, take that fundamental kind of experience for granted. But our families deal with those experiences every day. Another young woman, young mother, said, if I could just finish my education, that would be thriving because then I would be empowered to do so much for my children and to show my children what's possible in their lives. Another young woman, young mother, raised her hand and said, thriving for me would be if I could just get access to substance abuse services that could help me deal with everything I've faced in my life. 
Something as fundamental as getting a critical service was almost beyond her reach. And to think about having that would be thriving for her. They aren't asking for a brand new fancy car or all the money in the world or an incredibly big house. They're asking for the basic things that we all need. And more times than not, those are the things that our system fails to provide to our families. I'm not suggesting that the Child Protection Agency has to be in the business of providing all the fundamental supports that families need. But if we're serious about changing those words that David just shared with you, those experiences that you and others out there have had, we have to commit ourselves to joining with a much broader community of organizations, agencies, people, communities who are concerned about the well-being of children and parents who live in their communities. We have to get really, really serious about creating the communities where families can go to get the kind of help they need before the call comes in to the hotline. When I meet with parents over and over again, one of the constant refrains that I hear is, I'm afraid to ask for help. I know I need help, but I'm afraid. What are they afraid of? You know. They're afraid somebody's going to take their children away from them simply for asking for help. That's going on out there right now. Within the last two months, I was in another state, and I made that comment before a group of people, and immediately a parent advocate who works with parents who were going through the child welfare system came right up to me and she said, just within the last few weeks, I was working with a young mom who said I need help. She said, I'm afraid to go in and ask for help because I'm afraid they're gonna take my baby away from, her, from me. The parent advocate helped her to go in and ask for help. And guess what? They took her baby away from her. Instead of offering the critical supports that she needed, they inflicted a huge blow on the integrity of that parent-child relationship. They did something to affect the brain development of that child because of that trauma. And it may not show up for a very long time. But if that's the only tool we've got in our toolbox, we have to do better. Jay mentioned the Family First Prevention Services Act, which Congress passed last year on a Wednesday. I wonder why we hadn't implemented it by Monday. We're still working on it. It gives us an extra tool. It gives us something added that we can offer to many parents and their children but only when they are at imminent risk of entering the foster care system, which means the call has already come in to the hotline. It means the trauma has already been inflicted on a child. It means a parent has already suffered additional blows to their self-esteem, their ability to cope, and reinforce the trauma that they probably experience themselves as children. Still, with that extra tool, we can access federal funds to pay for services to try to help families stay together when that threat of removal, that threat of foster care is imminent. And that's an important tool for us to have. I'll never minimize that, but I will always say it's not enough. It is absolutely not enough. That is one form of prevention, but true prevention would allow us to provide supports to those families before that child ever became at imminent risk of entering the foster care system. And that's the change that we want to see. 
in our child welfare system across the country. We want to see a system that's grounded in communities where you live, where other families live, so that they can get the services that they need when they need them, instead of having to take four means of transportation to get across town or get to another town, instead of having to pay childcare and take off work when they don't have enough money to put food on the table, to go for an hour of mental health counseling that they might not even need. We want those community-based services that any family out there could benefit from. And when we make those kinds of services available to families, guess what? I think we get to the families who are at the greatest risk, who've suffered the greatest difficulty. You're off to a resounding start in that way here in New Jersey with your family success centers. That is an incredible community-based model. And on other trips, I've had the pleasure of visiting with those centers and seeing some of the work that's occurred there. I've had the pleasure in New York City of visiting with family enrichment centers that are modeled after New Jersey's family success centers. And I'll be leaving tonight to go to Pittsburgh to visit with some family support centers that are also grounded in those same basic, fundamental, family-strengthening, community-supporting community values that I know all of you share with us here in New Jersey. I commend you for taking those steps. For all the families here, I commend you so much for doing what you have done to overcome a system that is harsh, to say the least, and difficult, to say the worst. What you've done, you've done for your children. You've demonstrated tremendous strength that your children need to see. They need to know that in spite of difficulty, you have the ability, you have the will, you have the determination to give them the kind of life that any child out there deserves. I appreciate, I appreciate you, I appreciate your efforts, and as long as I'm in this job, I'm gonna keep fighting for that same kind of experience for those many, many, many families out there across our country who have not yet been able to have that kind of success. So thank you very much.